Lord Jesus, when we think about that question, where else would we turn? Well, we have no answer. There is no one else who is the way, who is the truth, who is the life. There is no other source of help to which we could look for our deepest needs, our most enduring needs, our eternal needs. And Lord Jesus, you are good. You are the word become flesh. You are the one who created and sustains all things. You are the one who came to this earth to take our sin upon yourself. Lord Jesus, there is no savior like you. There is no man like you. There is no God like you. And to you and to you alone may we turn. Even now as we look to your word, we pray that you would be glorified in our soft-heartedness towards you. God, would you overturn things in us that are displeasing to you? And may we readily find you to be the shepherd and savior that you are. And we ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'll invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. We'll begin this morning a series in John 10, and we'll be covering over a number of weeks some key chapters, key sections of our Bible, even a couple of uh, key verses, uh, really some of my own favorites, but some that I think are essential uh, for us as a church. And John chapter 10 is... One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, it is rich. And we discover in John chapter 10 the, the reality of God's sovereignty and salvation. We see there how God overrules human spiritual inability and draws people effectually to himself. We discover in John chapter 10 an explanation of why some people respond to the truth and some do not. We see in John chapter 10 an affirmation of the deity of Christ, and really one of the most striking affirmations from Jesus' own lips where he declares that he is in fact God in the flesh. And we see in John chapter 10 Jesus going toe-to-toe -to -toe with corrupt religious leadership. But mostly I'm drawn to John chapter 10 to see Jesus as the good shepherd, Jesus as the shepherd of his people. What is Jesus like as a shepherd? And what is it like to be his sheep? Jesus is a good shepherd. He is, in fact, the good shepherd. And friends, it is good to be his sheep. That's what I want us to see as we work through John 10 in the coming weeks. Jesus' compassionate care, his courage and conviction, his purpose and his power to lead, protect, and to provide for all that his people need. I want you to look at John chapter 10 and verse 11. This is really the verse that drew me to this chapter a number of months ago. Jesus says there, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. A simple statement. It begins with the I am phrase that occurs a number of times in the gospel of John. This is one of a number of statements that begin I am in the gospel. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. And strikingly in John 8, 58, Jesus simply says, before Abraham was, I am. These I am statements are a declaration of Jesus' identity. He is the I am. He is Yahweh in the flesh, the self-existent one, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, become flesh. And Jesus here says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus doesn't say, I am a good shepherd. He declares himself to be the good shepherd. That is, his identity as a shepherd is unique his identity as a good shepherd is unique. He is the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd par excellence. He is the shepherd by which every other shepherd is to be measured. There is no one like him. There is no one good like him. And there is no shepherd like him. He is the good shepherd. 
And he is good in the sense of his moral excellence, and he is qualitatively exquisite. He's good in the sense that he always does what is right. He, he is good, and he does what is good. He is also good in, in the fact that he is delightful. And he is a shepherd. The metaphor of a shepherd means that Jesus has charge and responsibility and a stewardship over others. Uh, stewardship, a charge to lead and protect and to feed. Jesus, as the shepherd of his people, it is described in Matthew 9, 36. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Think about what it means for people as sheep without Jesus. Such people are like sheep and all that it means to be sheep, but without the good shepherd. Jesus' compassion is provoked in his relationship as a shepherd to sheep. He loves his sheep. John 10, 11 tells us that he lays down his life for his sheep. Let's read together John chapter 10 in its entirety, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. A division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and he is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple of the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Then Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. 
Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. We are parachuting into this wonderful chapter. There's a disadvantage to uh, having a parachute and dropping into something out of context, not having seen the flow of thought. We're going to spend a number of weeks in John chapter 10. And in order to do that, we need to spend some time thinking through the context. And this morning will serve as an introduction to a series in John 10. And I want you to see some of the backdrops of this chapter. And really, we should just preach the entirety of the gospel of John up to John 10. Someday, perhaps as a church, we will do that. I don't want to wait until someday for us to experience this text together as a church and be affected by it. So we are parachuting in, and by way of introduction to the series this morning, I want to give you the backdrop to John chapter 10. In fact, I want to give you four backdrops. This will serve as the outline for the message this morning. Four backdrops to Jesus declaring himself the good shepherd. Backdrop number one is simply the backdrop of God being a shepherd. God describes himself as a shepherd in relationship to his people throughout the Bible. Shepherding was a familiar metaphor in the Middle Eastern world, a familiar metaphor all over the pages of Scripture, perhaps somewhat unfamiliar to us. Uh, We don't see sheep often. I don't know any of you who are professional sheep taker carers. That's a foreign industry to most of us. Some people have sheep as pets. Uh, There are some sheep herders around, but shepherding in America, shepherding in New Zealand, shepherding in England, shepherding in the modern day is done somewhat different than shepherding in the Middle Eastern world. We like sheepdogs. The Middle Eastern world had shepherds. And the relationship of sheep to shepherds is a metaphor that's found throughout the Bible. It's so ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It was the industry that everybody was familiar with. I tried this week to come up with some parallel to shepherding, you know, the the kind of blue-collar work that everybody was familiar with. The the uppity-ups in society looked down upon that low-class blue-collar work, but everybody needed it. Everybody depended on it. The economy depended on sheep and shepherds. And so, you know, you can think of industries we all use every day and depend upon and think about who does those kinds of things and how needful we are on them. And, And the metaphors, the illustrations that come from those industries we all depend on uh, would be something like what it would th- what it would be like to think about shepherding as an illustration. Shepherds became a ready illustration for all kinds of truths. Sheep were an illustration for all kinds of truths throughout the Bible. God Himself describes Himself as a shepherd. And if you just think about that for, the, for a moment, you think when Israel was in the land of Goshen in Egypt, the Egyptians put them there because. They didn't have space for shepherds. They looked down on shepherds. They didn't like sheep, and they didn't like the people who took care of them. And Israel, as an entire people group, was an agrarian people of shepherds. And so they were looked down on by the Egyptians. Low class, blue collar, underprivileged employment um, that everybody needed and the economy depended on. But God takes on that image to himself. God describes himself as a shepherd. Genesis 48, 15 Israel, uh, the man named Israel, uh, who was named Jacob, blessed his son Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. There, the the man who wrestled with God, the man who, who became the namesake for the nation of Israel, described his relationship to God, his personal relationship to God, as one of a shepherd to sheep. 
God was his personal shepherd. And in Genesis 49, with the blessings to the kids, uh, he says, from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, there is the shepherd of Israel. So God was described not only as Jacob's personal shepherd, but as the national shepherd of the people of Israel. You're familiar, of course, with the 23rd Psalm. This is David, the man who was a shepherd, describing Yahweh as his own shepherd. He says, Yahweh is my shepherd. Implication of that is I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through a very dark valley, I fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. David's shepherd song, extolling his own relationship to Yahweh as a sheep to a shepherd. Psalm 28, 9 says this, Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd also and carry them forever. Psalm 78, 52 records that God led his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. There, God caring for his people tenderly, compassionately in the wilderness wanderings. Psalm 80, verse 1 gives this plea. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth. Here the glorious one is a personal shepherd to his people. Isaiah 40, 11 tells this about what is coming for Israel. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. God is described as a shepherd of individuals in his grace and of the nation of Israel in his covenant promises. And then, of course, throughout Scripture, people are described as sheep in their relationship to God. And, and at worst, sheep are stubborn and smelly, wander-prone. They're not particularly strong in situational awareness or discernment. They are hapless victims of predators. They would dehydrate and starve if not led to still waters and green pastures. They would injure themselves if not guided carefully. But at best, sheep are vulnerable, needy, compliant, they are shepherdable. They look to and they trust their shepherd for leading, for protection, for provision. These pictures of sheep in the Bible are really good descriptors of us. At our worst, prone to wander. And at our best, sheepishness, trusting our shepherd. These are good pictures. Psalm 74.1 Oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? The psalmist asks. Psalm 79, 13. We, your people, are the sheep of your pasture. We will give thanks to you forever. To all generations, we will tell of your praise. Psalm 95, 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that Yahweh himself is God. It is he who made us not we ourselves, we are his people and we are the sheep of his pasture. Sheep and shepherds are so familiar in scripture as a metaphor of God's relationship to his people that we might begin to wonder whether God created this fluffy marshmallow on toothpicks of an animal simply to create the illustration that's in the scriptures about people and their relationship to God. The image of a shepherd is a humble metaphor for God himself. The image of sheep is a humbling metaphor for God's people. It's all over the Bible. And when Jesus shows up on the scene in John 10 and says, I am the good shepherd, and he talks about my sheep, and they hear my voice, and I lay my life down for them. This would readily draw to our attention all of the backdrop of Scripture leading up to this moment. God sees himself as a shepherd of his people. 
and all that it means for him to be so. There's a second backdrop to John chapter 10, and it is the backdrop of the shepherds of Israel. And by this, I mean God shepherded his people, the nation of Israel, but he did so often through human agents. That is, God mediated his shepherding care through men, through sinful men, fallible men, men who had responsibility, stewardship, and accountability for the very serious business of leading, protecting, guiding, and feeding God's people. There are, of course, serious implications here for anyone who would be a servant leader of God's people, for kings, for priests, for prophets, for teachers in the Old Testament, or in our day for pastors. Pastor, of course, is the Latin word for shepherd. But as we think about the, the, uh, the shepherds of Israel, those kings and leaders and teachers, prophets and priests, there is the good and the bad and the ugly in the history of the mediating shepherds of God's people in Israel's history. There were shepherds who were pretty good. There were shepherds who were pretty bad, and, and there were shepherds who were just downright ugly in their shepherding care of God's people. You know that Moses was a shepherd, an actual shepherd, caring for literal sheep before he led the people out of Egyptian slavery. And you have to think that would have been good training Moses might have felt that he had been shelved and put out of the way for 40 years when, in fact, God's own heart was on display in terms of compassionate care and courage and integrity that it would take to be a leader of God's people. Psalm 77 says this, You, God, led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Here is God's mediating, shepherding care through people, through men like Moses. Isaiah 63 records this, I will make mention of the loving kindnesses of Yahweh, the praises of Yahweh, according to all that Yahweh has granted us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people. And Isaiah the prophet records in verse 9 of Isaiah 63, in all of their afflictions, God was afflicted. The angel of his presence saved them. The angel of his presence is the angel of Yahweh. Uh, that is the second person of the Trinity, the pre-incarnate Christ, preserving his people in the Old Testament. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them and he carried them all the days of old. They rebelled. They grieved his Holy Spirit. Verse 11, then his people remembered the days of old of Moses, where God who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock. God is the one who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them. He caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name. Who led them through the depths? Like the horse in the wilderness, they did not stumble. As the cattle which go down into the valley, the Spirit of Yahweh gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. And there we see God's purpose and the angel of Yahweh carrying out his purposes for Israel to faithfully lead them, shepherd them, guide them, protect them, feed them through their wilderness wanderings. And he did so in part through the agency of Moses, the shepherd leader. Moses' successor was Joshua. Joshua or Yeshua means Yahweh saves. Listen to Numbers chapter 27. Moses spoke to Yahweh saying, May Yahweh, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in. And that phrase go out and come in is going to show up in John 10 in some significant ways who will go out and come in before them, who will lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of Yahweh will not be like sheep which have no shepherd. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew, we read earlier, God's people were like a sheep without shepherd. Moses' prayer here is that God would provide someone after Moses who would be a shepherd of God's people to lead them out and bring them in so that they would not be shepherdless. So Yahweh said to Moses, take Yeshua, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. That's an interesting baton passing from, from Moses to Joshua. 
And, and it is interesting that Jesus' name shall be called Jesus or Yeshua. Jesus is going to be the one to whom Moses looked, uh, the one Moses anticipated. There, there is going to be a shepherd over his people. There is going to be a better prophet than me who comes. You will listen to him. There is even a hint at that in having a man named Joshua take over the role of leadership in Israel after Moses. When we think forward to the New Testament and we ask, how did that go? How, how did the handing off in the near term to Joshua, son of Nun, go? This is the testimony of Hebrews 4. If Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Oh, what's going on here in biblical history? It means when the Israelites made it into the land under the shepherding care of the angel of Yahweh, they were not yet with circumcised hearts in the land to be able to benefit from the ministry of the angel of Yahweh, being obedient from the heart to all that God had commanded. So the blessings that would come via the promises of Deuteronomy 28 would not be affected in their time. They did not enter the promised land and experience the messianic rest that God had in store for them yet. And that's why Hebrews says there is a Sabbath rest for the people of God yet to come. From Moses and from Joshua, we fast forward to David. And you know David's life. He actually was a shepherd before he was the king of Israel. This, again, had to be a helpful occupation. Listen to 1 Samuel 17. David said to Saul, your servant, speaking of himself, was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear, oh my, came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and I rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, Yahweh, who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and may Yahweh be with you. Here the, the blue-collar shepherd is characterized by integrity, a love for Yahweh from the heart. The, the psalm writer, he's marked by courage and self-sacrifice and faith. 2 Samuel 5 records this. When Saul was king over us, David was the one who led Israel out and in. And Yahweh said to David, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will be a ruler over Israel. And interestingly, in 2 Samuel 5, the ideas of shepherd and ruler or king are tied together in the statement that God makes about David's coming career. Psalm 78 records of David that God chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes with suckling lambs he brought him, to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with skillful hands. And David is this prototypical, pretty good shepherd, king, ruler, servant. He's pretty good. And the kings of Israel and Judah that came after David, there, there were some that were pretty good, there were some that were pretty bad, and there were many of them that were downright awful. And by the time you get to the prophet Ezekiel, the situation is so awful that God enlists Ezekiel the prophet to indict the religious and political leadership of Israel for their shepherding. And I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. When thinking about the history of the shepherds of Israel, Ezekiel 34 becomes a significant backdrop for what Jesus says and does in John chapter 10. Follow along as I read Ezekiel 34, beginning in verse 1. Then the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and you clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost." 
but with force and with severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. They became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of Yahweh. As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has become even food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. My shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and they did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore. But I will deliver my flock from their mouth so that they will not be food for them. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. We already read John 10. Do you hear the echoes of Ezekiel 34 in there? What is Jesus doing in John 10? He is fulfilling Ezekiel 34, 11, when Yahweh says, I myself will come and I will rescue my people out of the mouths of the bad shepherds. Look at Ezekiel 34, 23. I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them and he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. This is a reference to the new David, the, the one from the Davidic line who will come and be a shepherd king over God's people. This is an anticipation of the good shepherd. Notice in Ezekiel 34 what, what God's mediating shepherds should have done. God is against them because they didn't go after the lost. They didn't feed the sheep. They didn't gather those who were scattered. The, these shepherds of Israel had neglected God's people. They had neglected good shepherding care of God's people. And what was the result? God's people were scattered on every high hill and under every green tree. That is Old Testament code for idolatry. That is, they were worshiping the pagan gods of the surrounding nations on every high hill and under every green tree. Uh, they were subject to deception to satanic and man-made religious systems because God's mediating shepherds failed. They were negligent and derelict in their duties. And worse than being negligent, they actually feasted on the sheep. They should have been feeding the sheep. They were eating the sheep. It's a tragic indictment. Notice how many times in Ezekiel 34, God calls these sheep my flock. They didn't belong to the shepherds, the mediating shepherds. They, they belonged to God. And so all of this sets us anticipating a good shepherd, a good shepherd king, a good shepherd servant leader king who would come. Listen to Micah chapter 2. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will gather together the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in the fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. They will be noisy with men. The breaker goes up before them. They break out, they pass through the gate, and they go out by it. So their king goes on before them, Yahweh at their head. Here in Micah chapter 2, the prophet puts together Yahweh, their king, and a shepherd. And Micah 2 leads right into Micah 3. The very next verse, Micah 3, 1 says, And I said, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and the rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and, and their flesh from their bones, you eat the flesh of my people. You strip off their skin from them, break their bones, chop them up as for the pot and as meat in the kettle. And Micah sounds a lot like Ezekiel with the twin themes of God himself will come and shepherd his people because the shepherds of Israel were awful. They were eating the sheep, taking advantage of the sheep, oppressing the sheep rather than caring for them. 
Micah goes on in Micah chapter 5, As for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of Yahweh, in the majesty of the name of Yahweh his God, and they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. And this little tag in Micah chapter 5, to the ends of the earth, ties together Yahweh, the king, the shepherd, the ruler, and this idea that the shepherding care would extend beyond the nation of Israel. This theme is picked up by Isaiah in Isaiah 49 verse 5. And now says Yahweh, who formed me from the womb to be his servant... And Isaiah 49 in our English Bibles capitalizes servant because this is the servant of Yahweh, the same servant of Yahweh who is the sacrificial lamb in Isaiah 53, crushed on behalf of sins. This is, again, the, the pre-incarnate Christ described here and then his messianic ministry described. He would be the servant to bring Jacob back to God so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of Yahweh and my God is my strength. Yahweh says of him, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says Yahweh, the redeemer of Israel and its holy one to the despised one, that is to the despised servant of Yahweh, to the one abhorred by the nation, that is Yahweh, the servant abhorred by the nation of Israel. To the servant of the rulers, kings will see and they will arise, princes will bow down because of Yahweh who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Therefore, shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth into joyful shouting, O mountains, for Yahweh comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Think for a moment about all of this backdrop of the history of Israel's shepherds as a backdrop to John chapter 10. The mediating shepherds were sometimes pretty good and sometimes awful. But Jesus, the servant of Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh who ushered his people through the Exodus, the one whose task it is to get his people into the land, to give them new hearts and to usher in the blessings of God's promise and Sabbath rest, he is also the coming king. He is the new David, the new shepherd king of Israel. And he is also the light to the nations, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. That is the one who is coming to search for his sheep and to seek them out. That is a backdrop to John chapter 10, thinking through the history of Israel's shepherds, anticipating the good shepherd. There's a third backdrop, backdrop to John chapter 10, and it is very simply John chapter 9. John chapter 9 is the story of the Sabbath healing of a man born blind. And we'll dig more into this context next week, Lord willing. I want you to look at John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke, saying... I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And again, this I am statement with the definite article. I am the light of the world. Here Jesus is in the temple complex, surrounded possibly at night by all the lights, the blazing fires that are lighting up the temple complex, and he says, I am the light of the world. And you can imagine a nighttime scene if you've been around a place with bonfires. There are shadows in the dark, and, and one man standing in a, in a dark temple complex that has bonfires and lights and candles and torches blazing, saying... All these lights you see around you, no, I am the light of the world. That's a madman statement. Nobody should say such a thing. And yet Jesus, being the light of the world, has every right to say such a thing. To have the world look to him uh, rather than what happened to be the empty religious system surrounding him. To prove the point that he is the light of the world... Jesus heals a man in John 9 who was blind from birth. 
and whose only recourse, only potential income, only mode of existence was to sit in public places and beg. Could you imagine being this man? What would it be like to have never seen? What would it be like to be at the mercy of those around you who would provide for you and then as just a, a way to make a life, to sit in open spaces and beg for money? Especially in a context where the prevailing notion was, if you're suffering, it is because you sinned or maybe your parents that certainly was the theology of the religious leaders. In fact, Jesus' own disciples asked the question, so who sinned, this guy or his parents? Could you imagine being this man? What does Jesus say about him? He's blind because I'm going to glorify myself through what I'm about to do. And a long time of suffering in darkness in order to see but this blind beggar's seeing is enlightening far beyond one mortal getting physical eyes for the first time. This is a demonstration, a proof that Jesus can say, I am the light of the world, and him not be crazy or a liar. Jesus truly is the light of the world, and he heals this man blind from birth in order to prove it. He broke the man-made traditions that uh, trumped God's compassion in that day by healing the man on a Saturday, on a Sabbath. He didn't break God's law in doing so. He did break Pharisaical tradition. And really, the issue there was, was not even so much their tradition, but their position and their power. You see, these religious leaders had God's people under their thumbs. They were tyrants and oppressors. They were awful shepherds of Israel. When the man told the truth about who healed him, the leaders of Israel excommunicated him. They de-synagogued him. And you can feel the oppressive weight of the corrupt leadership as they interrogate his parents and as they interrogate the man. As if his parents have done something wrong in having the son or, or he's done something wrong in experiencing the compassion of God through a miraculous healing. How dare you get eyes for the first time in your life? Look at John 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out. And finding him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And, and, and you get this readiness of heart to embrace Everything Jesus is about to say. Now, this is faith in a man that, uh, faith in a man's heart that God has prepared and produced. Jesus said, You have both seen him, which is remarkable. He's seeing for the first time what is the first experiences that he has with new sight. Jesus. He is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and notice verse 38, and he worshiped him. Matthew 4.10 says, nobody gets worshiped but God alone. This is a striking statement of an affirmation of Jesus' deity on the lips of a healed man. And if Jesus were good and he were not God, he would have undone this statement. Jesus readily accepts worship here. And he says in verse 39, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see. What a really remarkable statement. And, and Jesus healing the blind man is a judgment. Jesus said, I came into this world to judge the world. How does he judge it right here? He says, I'm the light of the world. And he causes a man born blind to see for the first time. And then the tables are turned. Jesus turns his attention to the corrupt leadership. Look at verse 39. And that those who do see may become blind. The Pharisees who were with him heard these things and they said to him, we're not blind too, are we? And the answer is yes, that's the whole point. 
you are spiritually blind. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but since you say we see, your sin remains. Jesus affirms they claim to be able to see, not just physically, but spiritually, truth. He indicts them for their real spiritual blindness and heaps upon them culpability for it. They are blind, leading the blind. They are no good shepherds. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the light of the world. He proves it. This interchange with the blind man and his parents by the Pharisees was truly an attack on Jesus with precious, precious sheep in the crossfire. Notice verse 22 of John 10. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. This leads to the fourth backdrop, the feast of dedication. In this scene where light and darkness are put in contrast, again, some have supposed that this whole dialogue takes place at night. The feast of dedication was in our December. It's, it's dark. The nights come early. The bright fires lighting up the temple complex would be there. The healing of the blind man, the indictment of blind shepherds of Israel, all of that, the backdrop here. But this fourth backdrop is the feast itself that's taking place. The audience of John 10, 1, truly, truly, I say to you, the audience is the Pharisees from John chapter 9. There's no transition, no scene change. This is the Pharisees. Uh, back in chapter 9, verse 22, uh, Jesus talks about the Jews. That is a pejorative to describe the corrupt Jewish leadership. This interchange here between the, the Jews, those opposed to Messiah, and the Pharisees, is an attack on Jesus. This festival of lights, um, or the, the feast of the dedication, verse 22, celebrates that cleansing of the temple and rededication of the temple in A.D. 164, that intertestamental period. This is the period of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus IV, the Syrian ruler, the Seleucid ruler who had run over Israel and Jerusalem. He was in a series of wars with the Ptolemies in Egypt. We've been covering his career on Sunday nights in our study of Daniel. In 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes, who had Greekified the land of Israel, convinced that he wanted to eradicate Judaism in total, and he would sort of culture it out by making everything Greek. Uh, Greek gods, Greek language, uh, Greek sports, uh, Greek ways of doing things. He introduced lots of immorality and officially sanctioned all the immorality uh, that was there in his day. And when that did not eradicate Judaism, uh, he took more severe measures. He made it a capital offense to observe the Sabbath. A number of women uh, found in a cave trying to observe the Sabbath without being discovered uh, were all slaughtered on the spot by Antiochus' soldiers. It was a capital offense to circumcise your children. If they discovered that you had circumcised your children, they would hang the children by their necks, slay the parents, and then loot the houses. It was illegal, punishable by death, to possess copies of the Old Testament. It was illegal to participate in temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. It was illegal to celebrate the feast day observances, all of those punishable by death. Antiochus Epiphanes was the worst enemy of Israel up to that point and the worst still to come until the Antichrist comes. It was on December 16th of 167 B.C. that he perpetrated what the prophet Daniel described as an abomination that causes desolation, as a prefigurement of what Antichrist will do one day. And he set up an image of Zeus in the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar. He made priests eat pork. He described himself as God even while he made the Jews worship the Greek pantheon of gods. And it was Judas Maccabees or Judas the Hammer who led the Maccabean revolt against the Syrian tyrant. He was an upstart fighter who led guerrilla warfare skirmishes. Uh, one day his entire, uh, his entire army was attacked on a Sabbath, and because they wanted to observe the Sabbath, they didn't fight back. They decided in the second battle they should fight back because they got slaughtered and, and run out of town. They began to win some surprising victories, and the fear of Judas the Hammer spread everywhere throughout the Syrian Empire. More Jews joined their cause. Eventually, they won back the temple precincts from the Syrians, and they cleansed the temple. And on December 14th, 164 BC, they rededicated the temple, 
Uh, they set up lights and candles for a series of days to celebrate that. That is where Hanukkah comes from, the reestablishment of the sacrificial system. This festival of lights that's the backdrop in John 10 or Hanukkah celebrates the cleansing and rededication of the temple, the reinstatement of biblical sacrifice after the people of Israel were trampled by the blasphemous tyrant Antiochus Epiphanes who put himself in the place of God over God's people. So in John 8, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. He heals the man born blind in John 9. He declares the leaders of Israel themselves to be blind. And then he says in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. Now, what is going on here? Jesus has picked the time and the place to declare the fulfillment of Ezekiel 34, 11, that God himself has come. He enters the sanctuary that has been defiled by an elitist, priestly, and political class that set itself up over God's precious people as tyrants. The religious leadership in Israel was acting as little gods, not caring for the sheep, but fleecing the sheep, not feeding God's people, but eating God's people, not leading them to good pasture, but stealing from them their last two copper coins in order to fund their lavish living and their hypocrisy. And in John chapter 10, in a scene reminiscent of Judas the hammer, Jesus is rescuing his sheep, this man born blind, from the jaws of wicked religious tyranny. For Jesus to stand here in the Feast of Dedication to address the leaders of Israel and say, I am the good shepherd, is an indictment against their wicked hypocrisy. And it exposes what's truly going on in their hearts. It is significant that Jesus addresses the Pharisees and the Jewish leadership with this statement about why he was here. To rescue his own precious sheep from their corrupt sheep pen, which was apostate Judaism. Jeremiah 10, 21 said, The shepherds of Israel have become stupid. They have not sought Yahweh. They have not prospered. All their flock is scattered. Jeremiah 12, 10, Many shepherds have ruined my vineyard. They have trampled down my field. They have made my pleasant field a desolate wilderness. Unlike Judas the hammer, Yeshua the shepherd Messiah king did not incite guerrilla warfare or lead an insurrection. The good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. He indicted the wicked shepherds. He came and said, I am the good shepherd. And then he said, the shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We need to see John 10. We need to see Jesus as our shepherd to remind ourselves how good it is to be sheep. Listen, there's something in the human constitution that says, I don't need to be led. I don't need to be fed. I don't need to be protected. I don't need to be warned. Jesus is a good shepherd who loves his sheep. He is the good shepherd who feeds his sheep. What does it mean to have Jesus as your shepherd? It means a glorious mix of truth and compassion. It means to know a God whose heart is soft and tender toward his people in their need, that he cares, he loves, he leads, he guides, he feeds, he provides. He is fierce with predators, and he is the defender of his sheep. He is an unconquerable warrior shepherd king, and he gives his sheep eternal life, and no one can snatch them out of his hand. What does it mean for you, for us, to be his sheep. It means we follow. Where he goes, that, that's where we want to go. What he says, that's what we want to do. It, it means we trust Jesus. What Jesus says are green pastures and still waters. That's what we will believe. That's where we will go. Let me just ask you this morning, are you shepherdable under Jesus' good shepherding care? Do you see yourself the way God's metaphor of sheep and shepherds intends? Vulnerable, attractive to predators, injury prone, wandering prone, needy. These things provoke the compassionate heart of God. How is your sheeping going? Do you see yourself as needy?
dependent, vulnerable. Listen, do you know his voice? My sheep hear my voice, Jesus will say in John 10. Do you recognize his voice in his word? Do you heed his word? Is his word a comfort to you and a balm for your soul? Are his rod and staff helpful to you? Or do you see these things as a threat? One of the questions we must ask is, are you a sheep at all? Listen, you may have grown up under a false, phony, man-made, oppressive religious system where people pretending to be speaking for God told you what to do. And they ushered you down a broad path to destruction. You need to know Jesus is a good shepherd. He lays down his life for his sheep. He loves his sheep. He cares for his sheep. He speaks to his sheep and calls them by name. If you find yourself trapped in the attempt to try to make yourself right with God by the traditions of men, you need to know that coming to Jesus and letting go of those things means life. It means joy. It means freedom from slavery to sin and freedom from hypocrisy. It means freedom from the tyranny of man-made systems. It's good to be a sheep. We have in Jesus, the Messiah, the good shepherd. And the metaphor breaks down because Jesus, the shepherd, makes sheep for himself by having become a sheep. In the imagery of Isaiah 50, 53, he was the one who, like a sheep, went to the slaughter. He did not open his mouth. He did not protest. He himself was vulnerable and compliant under the crushing weight of God's judgment as a substitute. The lamb slain in our place. It's good to belong to Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our master, our shepherd king, and the lamb who was slain, we adore you. We lift our eyes to you. We, we turn to you. We want our hearts to gravitate to your call, to your words, to your voice. We confess to you our need. We are like sheep, dull, wander prone, injury prone. We, we wouldn't know how to protect ourselves. We would run into danger. We would starve without your feeding. Jesus, we need you. We are ever grateful that you, humble of spirit, came. Though you are the King of kings and rightly the Lord of lords, to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, you are also gentle and compassionate with us, even in our waywardness, to bring us to yourself, to guide, to lead, protect, and feed. And we worship you. Even in song, we do this, and we do this with our lives as we go from here. In your name, amen.